So welcome everybody to our presentation on the use of threat intelligence in the automotive security. Um, thank you very much for joining our little talk uh, today. And we're going to talk a little bit about the automotive threat landscape, the use of threat intelligence, um, how to make intelligence actionable through threat modeling in the automotive world, um, then um, Janos is going to talk a little bit about product incident management, awareness, and then he's going to uh, give you a short demo on project uh, Dimitri. Um, with you today uh, are speakers from Ernst & Young as well as ThyssenKrupp. My name is Ben Sorvath. I lead our uh, next-gen security operations and advanced security teams um, in the EY cyber practice in London. And um, I'll let uh, Janos, my co-presenter, introduce himself. Greetings, everyone. My name is Janos Kovac, and I am the cybersecurity manager at ThyssenKrupp uh, Steering. And uh, we are currently working uh, really hard to be compliant with uh, the forming ISO 21434 standard as well as the UNEC regulation 155 uh, to create a secure automotive world. Thanks, Janos. Let's, uh, let's jump into the presentation directly. And um, as mentioned in the agenda, the first topic is uh, the automotive threat landscape or you know, what happens if the car becomes basically a computer on four wheels. Um, what are the main elements of the threat landscape and the ecosystem uh, today? So on a very high level, we see that um, you know now with with a modern um, digital connected um, car, um, automotive security has become a rather complex topic. You need to, um, of course, protect the products and services, uh, as well as the production and operation of um, automotive components. Um, but you need to also pay attention in protecting employees um, and consumers uh, from malicious actors, uh, as well as protection of businesses and, and branding. We've all known um, previous um, attacks against uh, car makers, as well as uh, um, automotive suppliers um, that have unfortunately led to serious incidences, but even those that do not lead um, to any incidences, um, you know, very uh, costly uh, recalls and fixes in uh, automotive products uh, can lead to damaging of the business, of the brands, um, of the suppliers as well. Um, and we really see this um, over a myriad of, uh, you know, um, various vectors, you know, from electric vehicles where um, the battery health status and management and over the air configurations and software updates are uh, becoming increasingly commonplace, uh, commonplace these days in, in intelligence vehicles to you know, safety and security features um, uh, that are built into modern cars to um, simple you know, constant updates on the infotainment um, systems uh, that can be arrived over the air. Um, but if we go a little bit deeper into it and and we take uh, our focus on to um, connected vehicles, um, we do see that, you know, um, modern uh, digital and digitally interconnected vehicles um, have very complicated uh, intra-vehicle systems um, and run a complex control area network uh, um, that includes the ECUs as well as a number of um, sensors, um, physical, you know, as well as wireless. Um, and uh, as the complexity of these systems increases, um, so does, of course, um, the need to uh, to defend them. 
Um, Janusz, is this is your, uh, you know, uh, absolute uh, subject matter uh, expertise, and you've been uh, working on this for, you know, quite quite a few years now. Is there anything that you would want to add uh, here as well? Yes, thank you. Uh, currently, uh, uh, um, the big picture is presented, uh, I guess, uh, really well by the UNEC Regulation 155, uh, which is the key success factor uh, of basically remaining on the market uh, as an automotive participant uh, in the close future. And uh, the UNEC Regulation 155 represents a holistic view of uh, vehicle cybersecurity. Uh, which consists uh, the back-end infrastructure of the OEMs and the suppliers, as well as the physical products uh, manifested by the vehicles. So, so yes, that, uh, I really like this uh, uh, figure because uh, it uh, contains everything we will need. <laughs> uh, thanks a lot. Yeah, we've tried. We've tried to put, uh, put everything together in one picture with. Is, as you mentioned, uh, if, if you're going from a uh, quite um, thorough and lengthy uh, legislation, it can be a bit of a challenge. Um, but what does it mean in, in real life? What are some of the examples of, uh, of attack vectors that we're seeing? And generally, what, of course, uh, we've seen, quote unquote, out in the wild um, are uh, remote attack vectors um, that have been uh, thankfully at this point largely uh, realized uh, through laboratory conditions but it is possible um, you know for a, for a remote attacker to use um, a connected device such as a passenger phone um, um, to send malicious files can be a song, it can be you know any other um, uh, file that uh, that is accessed uh, through the phone OS system, and uh, you know that 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 phone is then connected uh, to the IVI system of the car itself, and um, it is possible to execute certain attacks to again certain um, types of vehicles, uh, and we will talk about this a little bit um, later as well as um, the more, I would say, common attack vector that does require physical access to um, the actual uh, port, debug port of the car um, by an attacker. Now, this, um, this physical access, of course, can be um, replicated through a physical device that is then internet connected, but definitely, you know, it's, it's not something which uh, you can execute by, by simply, um, you know, just from the distance, you need physical access to the, to the car, to the debug port of the car um uh, where you are able to plug in uh, a malicious code directly via the debug car, car uh, debug port and thus take control over the vehicle so this is i would say the main points of the current um threat landscape in in automotive security um which we're going to be referring to throughout our presentation now, for the next section of our presentation, let's talk a little bit about cyber threat intelligence as um, you know, uh, the, top, the title of our presentation does talk about you know, the application of CTI in an automotive um, context. So um, in order to set the scene a little bit, let's talk about uh, what is cyber threat intelligence. So CTI is um, a topic that concerns itself um, information intelligence about threats. The specific nature of intelligence is, of course, driven by the requirements, how we use this intelligence um, that it has been designed to answer, and as well as the nature of the audience um, uh, to which, uh, to whom we're presenting uh, um, this intelligence. 
Um, CTI is, um, you know, actionable answers. It can be used as um, uh, a decision support uh, to um, make certain um, certain choices. Uh, let them be the choices of using, you know, various technologies or in order to support a uh, risk-based decision. Um, CTI is, of course, based on facts and corroborated observations and uh, you know on a higher level it does include a holistic approach uh, CTI in and of itself is um, not applied knowledge it is not uh, a covert action or an evidential chain you don't need to be a 007 to be able to uh, take your Aston Martin to get cyber threat intelligence uh, but really most uh, basic form you could understand the cyber threat intelligence as the answer to the questions, what are my top security risks? What are the threat actors um, targeting uh, me, my products, my um, uh, my consumers, my customers? And what are their objectives? What do they want to do? Do they want to, you know, ransom? And and uh, their their objective is financial gain, and that's what they want to do. Um, or do they want to create uh, fear, uncertainty, and doubt uh, in the capabilities of connected cars? And of course, the third answer is um, applying um, CTIs. The the you know, this is when you get actionable. Um, um, is how do I use this knowledge of threat actors and their objectives to defend my products, defend my uh, my customers, defend my uh, my company? There are four main types of of CTI which we are um, differentiating between the time horizons and the level of uh, context. So, of course, if we are talking about uh, immediate uh, threats in, in a low level context, this is uh, technical um, uh, intelligence. Uh, this is something that is, of course, uh, contains uh, specific malware or vulnerability exposure or information. How that uh, that uh, vulnerability uh, can be exploited. Um, then, if we're to moving uh, to a higher level into in the context area, then um, we're talking about operational intelligence. So this is, of course, um, details about um, certain attack vectors, uh, information about targeting, and of course, this is uh, information that can support uh, structured decision on the lower management level. You know, how do you um, support um, designing? You know, defending the enterprise as well as um, defending certain products that are in the product in the uh, security team. If we are thinking around more in the low level of context, but uh, on the long-term time horizon, um, then we arrive to uh, tactical um, intelligence that supports middle management and semi-structured decisions. You know, this is when we're talking about the techniques, tactics, and procedures and TTPs of um, of attackers and understanding. You know, what how does how do those change um, over time? Um, and if you are talking about high level of context and of course long term time horizons, that would be um, strategic intelligence that is uh, really um, uh, there to support unstructured decision making. You know, this is horizon scanning into the future. Uh, now, if we have our own threat intelligence, um, how can we apply that? And as I mentioned, uh, intelligence is an, in and of itself is just um, data, it's information. Um, how can we go from threat intelligence to threat modeling? Of course, we can um, create um, specific threat profiles, uh, specific um, con um, concepts, um, uh, from 
our knowledge of the products, our knowledge of the enterprise, um, as well as pro uh, our knowledge of the threat landscape. And we can develop, uh, you know, complex use cases based on these various threats. We can feed these into, uh, for example, a, a product development lifecycle um, to, you know, look for specific violations, suspicious events, uh, even, you know, malicious behavior, because, um, you know, we mentioned in the, in, in the earlier part of the presentation, you know, you might have absolutely valid reasons to access the debugging port of a car, for example, when it is brought for maintenance um, and uh, you could also have malicious reasons to inject uh, you know code into the vehicle system um, that would enable an attacker to then take control over the car and this of course is a cycle that keeps feeding on uh, in and of itself and we can also take into account you know various additional um, context around controls that exist in our products the risk uh, that uh, these certain vulnerabilities expose as of course as well as the threats so I mean if the threat is um, something really serious that would uh, you know affect the the handling or the safety features of a vehicle then uh, of course um, that uh, raises the risk level of um, of that per uh, particular issue but if the uh, exploit is uh, very much uh, theoretical and would require a level of um, access as well as specialized hardware to the car that, of course, decreases um, the risk contracts as well as, you know, there are additional controls that you can apply to say, okay, in theory, this uh, particular vulnerability can be exposed, but we've already um, put in, you know, various compensating controls, other measures to uh, um, to combat this threat. And uh, for the second part of the presentation, I will hand over um, the ball to uh, Janos to talk about the organizational benefits of CTI. Thank you, uh, Bence. Uh, so what are the organizational benefits of uh, the CTI? Uh, first, uh, uh, the most obvious uh, way you created for an organization uh, leveraging this uh, type of service is that uh, CTI can be an important trigger of uh, the product incident management because uh, uh, the situation for the automotive products are uh, really specific uh, and uh, really unique in the world of uh, the cyberspace because uh, you know the automotive products are left uh, basically at the digital wilderness uh, because uh, uh, this is really problematical to collecting the product cybersecurity data from the field because uh, especially as the tier one uh, supplier we do not have directly access uh, direct access uh, to our products uh, on the field. Uh, we can, uh, of course, uh, leverage data uh, collected by fleet management systems. Uh, however, this is not like uh, operating uh, uh, a security operation center uh, connecting directly to the infrastructure you uh, operate, uh, uh, but uh, rather uh, leaving uh, our products uh, basically in the wide. Uh, and uh, also the hackers uh, and uh, malicious attackers uh, are able to examine and attack the product without uh, basically be the, being bothered. Uh, we do not uh, know uh, uh, the e about the events uh, of uh, these kind of attacks because uh, you can just uh, disassemble a vehicle and uh, start uh, disassembling and uh, examining uh, the embedded products and uh, nobody will detect you doing so uh, because this is a part uh, uh, removed from the vehicle without uh, the power supply and the data bus connection of the vehicle. Uh, furthermore, uh, it is really important to consider that the more time is passed uh, between the zero-day exploit and the discovery of the system compromise, uh, the more harm can be done. It is a, a new universal truth and uh, this uh, 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 makes 
this interval uh, or uh, rather shortening this interval a key success factor uh, for keeping uh, our product secure and uh, this is because uh, because uh, uh, using uh, such service uh, may, can uh, make the difference uh, between a secure product and uh, basically an insecure product uh, so the involvement uh, of an experienced third party can be a major step for gaining these uh, benefits and uh, uh, getting to this achievement. Uh, what can be uh, this data useful for uh, furthermore? Uh, ben said, I mentioned uh, that uh, making the threat models uh, more accurate is also a valuable uh, benefit from this uh, service. And uh, I'm str I strongly uh, agree with him because uh, threat analysis and risk assessment uh, is the basis of uh, product cybersecurity concepts, uh, creating a threat model and uh, placing uh, our product in the cyberspace uh, within uh, its context and understanding its context. Uh, and uh, these threat models, accuracy, is the key, also a key success factor uh, for keeping a product secure. So uh, uh, it is also important to collect this data because uh, we have minimal amount of uh, exact historical data about the impacts of a vehicle product security breach. And uh, be, the, from, because of this, uh, we cannot uh, really uh, estimate uh, precisely the impact of a security breach and uh, because of that the importance of examining the transportation and industrial landscape is more important than ever and uh, the CTI data can be a basis of these interpolations and uh, it would make the company able to assess the product related cybersecurity risks in a more accurate way and there is also one thing that uh, the frequent information of uh, the CTI service can uh, keep the threat model up to date and uh, it would uh, make us able to react uh, faster and swifter. And there is also one thing uh, that uh, CTI information can be a valuable asset in keeping up the awareness, the cybersecurity awareness and uh, uh, more uh, precisely the product cybersecurity awareness. We can leverage lessons learned, and uh, I should say that uh, lessons learned is uh, one thing that uh, we can turn uh, our, uh, our uh, previous failures, uh, future opportunities. And uh, I shall say that uh, even the exploits of other products uh, can be useful if we can uh, find the analogy between uh, those exploits and uh, our product's uh, way of working and uh, even architecture. And uh, the company educational programs uh, shall include uh, these vulnerabilities. Uh, and uh, these uh, vulnerabilities and the education of these vulnerabilities can direct the focus of the development and the vigilance of assurance uh, towards fixing uh, these future vulnerabilities. And uh, you know, uh, the fixing of vulnerabilities which never uh, uh, placed inside the product is the cheapest uh, way uh, for uh, fixing uh, vulnerabilities. And uh, these uh, informations can also be the basis of future test scenarios. Uh, and it happened that uh, I had uh, some free time in the past and uh, I uh, thought that uh, what could be the, uh, the more valuable application uh, for, of this uh, uh, threat informations on uh, the awareness uh, and, uh, and the awareness program. And uh, I happened to create the Dimitri project. Uh, this Dimitri project is an open source uh, project, uh, which is basically uh, a story based uh, classic uh, role playing uh, game, but uh, focusing on typical embedded uh, uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, and uh, I should say public information uh, getting from public uh, vulnerability databases. 
and uh, I'm strongly believe that uh, uh, this uh, project can be an uh, important example uh, or a useful example, shall I say, uh, for any other uh, professionals in the cybersecurity industry uh, implementing a security awareness program because uh, it means uh, gamification and uh, learning via gamification. If uh, we see there are important uh, vulnerabilities in the market, then uh, we shall prepare uh, not to place these vulnerabilities uh, inside our products. So in Dimitri project, there is two parts. One is the, the story, which is uh, placed in a cyberpunk uh, inspired uh, Eastern European city, Chernograd, and uh, there is an oppressive uh, regime. So it's uh, basically a quite generic uh, cyberpunk uh, uh, story. And uh, you are a uh, quite amateur vehicle electrician called Dimitri, who stands up uh, against this uh, oppressive regime, uh, firstly, to get the wider resources for him and his friends, and after that, uh, even, uh, uh, how can I say, defeating the, uh, this uh, oppressive regime. So this is based, uh, basically uh, on the classic fighting fantasy books. Uh, you uh, are uh, probably familiar with from the 90s. And uh, the another part, the technical part, is a virtual, virtualized environment simulating a connection between a diagnostic tool and an automotive ECU, an automotive embedded ECU. Uh, and you have means for communicating with the ECU and using diagnostic protocols. Uh, and uh, there are common vulnerabilities placed inside those ECU models. And uh, the, uh, how can I say this kind of capture the flag game is uh, closely connected and, uh, and uh, uh, proxies with uh, the story itself. Uh, here you can see the Dimitri uh, part two. This is basically the stage two. Uh, many thanks for Paul Ribar for sharing me this uh, image of uh, this uh, Gopnik guy uh, and uh, letting me use this uh, resource uh, in my project. And uh, here, uh, the story is that uh, Dimitri and his friends uh, made a set, uh, set up uh, ambush on an autonomous uh, uh, transportation truck uh, carrying uh, foods and uh, other supplies uh, to the, uh, how can I say, the uh, rich people uh, loyal to the oppressive regime. And uh, they do not have these kind of resources, but uh, but these are vital for them, of course, uh, like, uh, I mean, uh, Dimitri and his friends uh, needs these resources. So they made this ambush to uh, rob this uh, vehicle and get these uh, foods and supplies. Uh, Dimitri tried before, during the basically the tutorial mission, uh, to cause a denial of service on the CCU, and uh, he found a way for doing that. and. Uh, he is uh, basically uh, uh, ready for carrying out this attack. Uh, this model does not uh, focus on the uh, getting connected to this car, but uh, this connection is made uh, according to story uh, by uh, connecting a, a connector, a remote dongle uh, to the car uh, by leveraging inside their uh, threats like uh, Dimitri has a friend working in the transportation company. Okay, and uh, here is the first uh, help that uh, we should execute uh, the run stage two uh, bash file. Okay, uh, can you, uh, I hope you can see my screen even now. We executed uh, the Best script, and uh, here we see that uh, we just started up on our computer the diagnostic tool. Here we see the basic commands, and uh, 
we start to cause this denial of service. If this denial of service uh, on the engine control unit is successful, then uh, the car will stop and we will able to uh, get what we need from the cargo. Okay, here we see that uh, we shall use tester con to connect the tester to the vehicle. We connected, it uh, is successful. And uh, Dimitri happens to know the uh, correct uh, command for causing this denial of service because uh, he tried it at his home laboratory. So the, it's a little bit spoiler, but uh, he shall use the ECU reset uh, to cause this denial of service. Because when you uh, send the reset, then the ECU will uh, stop working and the engine will stop working. But hey, uh, it is a really big problem because uh, we got a negative response. Permission denied, uh, authentication is needed for this service because uh, maybe it happens that, uh, that uh, the OEM, which is the syndicate automotive company, uh, fictional company, of course, uh, made a security patch for fixing the vulnerability Dimitri exploited in the last stage. So uh, Dimitri uh, might be in a bit of trouble. Something is wrong uh, and, uh, and Dimitri need to fix this problem on the field and try to find uh, another uh, vulnerability here we have some uh, hints, some helps, and uh, we can get them by uh, coloring the uh, the fonts and coloring the text, which is hidden. We shall think leveraging service another than the diagnostic. This is because the diagnostic is uh, basically uh, the hardened and we cannot exploit this one. So uh, what can we do? Uh, do we have the standard diagnostics and uh, we also have the universal measurement and calibration protocol called the uh, XCP? We shall go by that. Uh, we connected to the XCP uh, and uh, we shall read the memory map. Okay, here we see uh, the values, the variables mapped to the uh, A2L file. And uh, here we see that uh, there is a privilege level. Uh, if I uh, read it out, it's a one, uh, which uh, might mean in our case that this is a default uh, uh, value we are uh, in a de default uh, field mode, basically. Okay, uh, let's uh, move further. Uh, what can I do? I could try to uh, overwrite uh, this value, maybe for a two. I executed this job. Let's see what happened. It's still the same. Uh, we might have no permission from writing uh, this value uh, even with the XCP protocol. Okay, let's uh, use another hint. Uh, this another hint is that uh, we should uh, get familiar with the uh, CV uh, top 25. Uh, let's see. What can we see here? Uh, I try to uh, make it a little bit more quick because I see we are running out of time. Uh, what can we see here? That uh, the second one is out of bronze uh, write and out of bronze read. Uh, what we see here, uh, we have memory addresses. Let's try uh, what we can do. Uh, XCP read address. If we try, for example, the consecutive failed attempts, this is uh, uh, not. Uh, uh, ready, something went wrong, but uh, the privilege level uh, is able to read out and uh, it is a one. 
But how about trying an entire enormously large number? Hmm. It happened to work. Uh, the ECU is reset uh, and uh, the car stops. If we move further, then we can see that uh, Dimitri and uh, his guys get the resources what they need and uh, everybody is happy, even the neighborhood uh, have his stomach filled. And uh, after that, I think this is also really important that there is a takeaway box, uh, which uh, is uh, for educational purposes and uh, and uh, the key takeaway informations are listed here that uh, the developers and the participants of the product lifecycle uh, might be able to use in their uh, further career. Okay, thank you for your attention and uh, we are glad to answer your questions in the remaining time left. Thank you very much everybody and thank you very much Janos for the very exciting story and presentation that you've um, that you've given us and uh, yes, I believe now it's time for Q&A.